and you have to add these to your. Um, basically, you have to add two of them to each body paragraph, so six total. And I gave you some of the hyphens and everything else they give you for everything from uh, from the call before, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. But remember yesterday or not yesterday? You saw Monaco last week. So many things have happened. Thursday, when I talk about the positive good theory, that you, when you read a document, you have to try to figure out you know, what that author is trying to succeed. succeed. Trying to succeed with, not succeed. Illustrate. <laughs> I got succeed in my head now. Civil War is in my head, I can't get it out. But what the author, author is trying to achieve with this document, you know, basically the purpose, what they are thinking in this. And so that's what you have to get to, you know, think about that. And that means if you know that, you have to relate it to what you know about history. You have to know something and know how that fits together. And so whenever you read documents, think about that. What is that author trying to achieve? What do they want to do with this? And then you have to also look at it and say, why do they have that point of view? And in the college board, they call that point of view and I give you a little explanation of other for the read the documents. And so read through this or you're familiar yourself with the terms. So maybe we can talk about it. When you turn it over, that is the rubric or the guideline. And it's seven point scale. And the big thing about a rubric is don't worry too much about the points. When I write a good essay, they'll give you the points. The, po the thing we have to get from this is what they think is important. And as we've already said before, we've gone over a lot, and we're going to go over more again, especially starting again, probably a little bit tomorrow and so on. We look more back to thesis statements. And then you have to use six documents and get evidence, basically, to show how the document um, will match your thesis statements. And other than that, historical evidence, you know, that's information you know, complex understanding, that's writing a good essay. That's all pretty basic stuff. On this sheet, I give you four documents and I give you examples. So I'm gonna look at this sheet. I give you four examples. And I go back um, Revolutionary War stuff. And I give four examples of how you would use the document in the sentence. You everyone see that? Four examples. And so you basically have to use one of your sentences in your body paragraph, will be from the document. And it's using information from the document. More importantly, your information you get from the document related to what you know. And I give you four examples there. So please, on your own, look at this. I will post some more things by DBQ. So when we come back next week, we have the basic elements kind of in your head. And so then we start doing a little bit more. Sound good? Next, would you like a little bit more homework? Would you like a little bit more homework? Uh -oh. Yes! Okay, you do have to read chapter 14. And you already have the bookmark. Bookmark, but I'm also going to give you an opportunity for extra credit. It is a short story. At the end of the short story, some questions on a separate sheet. Do them. Do the question and turn it in on Monday, and I'll give you extra credit. It's a great little short story about Ambrose Beers. It's about the Civil War. He, yeah, he was at the Battle of Shiloh. And I've used these documents many times, so please, please don't write on this. <laughs> Your name down here, just so I can use it again. But he was there, he wrote, he wrote this story, it's a, a great story. And questions are then, just four little questions. Sound good? Chapter 14, is here, right? Yeah, but I'll tell you what. I probably won't give you a quiz on chapter 14 on Monday, so as long as you have it done by Tuesday, but this will be due on Monday. And we do have a quiz small. A quiz small on chapter 11. Oh, thank you for helping me. Oh, I already got full. All right, should I think about it? Chapter 11 is what's due, due tomorrow, so I have a quiz. How many questions would you have in the quiz tomorrow? 50 to 60. 6, 8, 68, 682. Now we're going nuts. It's to do math. 
6 plus 8 is 68. What from 2018? Tomorrow's 11. 10 questions. I have 10 questions. Okay. How about that for a compromise? 10. So I know you want more, but 10. All righty then. Um, so just going to read through the documents, read how they use them. It's just you have to construct a sentence, basically the purpose of the document related to what you know. Oh, and I finally figured out how to get the transcript. We kept something really annoying pop up on the screen. And at this, it's translating. See? Isn't that exciting? Would that get really annoying really fast? Yes. Pizza. Yes. Pizza. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Raccoon. <laughs> ah! I hate that already. OK. <laughs> So do we get to this? Do we get to gold? No. Taylor jumped. Oh, Taylor won the election. Plenty of time. Nothing to fear. All the time in the world. By the way, what was that proviso to the amendment? Uh, that's a uh, spending amendment to say no slavery in the Mexican session. What was that called again? Wilmot. Yeah, that's Wilmot. So we got. Do we get to this? So, oh, what treaty ended the Mexican War? Guadalupe Hildago, yeah. And how much did the United States pay? 15 million plus 3.3, .3, we paid off Mexican debt. So 18.3 total. And oh, who is the general who took Mexico City, but then realized it's kind of trapped? Yeah, Winfield Scott. And we have popular sovereignty. We saw Canada. Let's go and get to this then. Remember, popular sovereignty was kind of a scam. So we end it right here, right? Let me get one more thing really quick. Even though it's 1853, the Gadsden Purchase, Gadsden was a Secretary of State under, get my president's right, Pierce. It purchased just a little blue piece of land right here. It's all blue if you go with it. Are you the people blue? Do, do the scarves they, live there? Well, it'd be, it, fortunately, the people are blue, only the land. And that's where like Tucson, Arizona is. But they bought that because it was flat for the transcontinental river. So they, it's really mountainous, really rugged here. And the U.S. paid $10 million to Mexico for this, partially out of Because it was outright just a theft of what uh, the United States paid for California. So they paid that much for that hunk of land right there. But eventually, the Southern Pacific Railroad would come through here. That's why they bought it. And that's continental United States. Though. Think about when Taylor was elected president. This was the United States. All of the, I'm not Taylor, I'm sorry. When Polk was elected, when he was elected, all that. You remember Tyler signed this to bring Texas in and all this came in under Polk. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. The change that happened in the United States that quickly. And considering how, what this is gonna mean to the United States down the road, it's. It's uh, forever a different country. And of course, the Mexican session, we'll get to that. So there's beautiful San Francisco. And this is 1849, 1848, I'm sorry. And small little town. There are a lot of people there, but the thought was Taylor had plenty of time. He didn't have to make a decision on Wilmot because he really didn't know. Lots and lots of time. And then gold. Gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, a little bit west of east of Sacramento, and then in the Sierra Nevadas near it was the mother love. Huge gold, huge, huge gold finds, veins of gold. They said that were, the gold was almost pure coming out of the ground. They couldn't believe what they were finding. 
And the thing about that was that is going to trigger the massive gold rush. All these people are going to come to California. This is one of my favorite signs ever. Take a, trip, take a quick trip down to Nicaragua by steamboat. Take advantage of the new technology. And then your stuff will be lugged across by 200 jackasses. <laughs> and then to California. So with that, I should add Cornelius Vanderbilt would get rich off that. We'll come back to him because he would use that money to buy up basically a railroad trust called the New York Central. And yes, he felt guilty about the way he did it. So he had a college named him, paid for a college called Vanderbilt. And because of this, they're going to be called the Commodores because he made his money as a owning ships, Commodore C. That's why. So at that, all those people who came the next year are going to be known as the 49ers. And the thing is, Mexico, remember, Mexico had banned slavery. There were no slave codes in California, the Mexican session. The people who went there did not bring slaves. All of a sudden, the population of San Francisco went up by 20%, I mean, 200%, just boom, overnight. And they're now more than big enough to become a state, and they would petition the U.S. government to jump right to statehood. So basically go right over territory to state, a free state. Literally, it's like someone exploded the public. Now Taylor has to make up their mind. Congress must pass the laws about now California, the Mexican session. And within six months, the confet or southern states are talking the way they always talk. We're going to secede. Literally overnight, talk of civil war. And so we have to get back then, talk a little bit about this. Slavery, what's going on? And this is from an anti-slavery journal. And yes, it talks about free, it's a British anti-slavery journal when Britain went through this weird transformation. It really wasn't weird how quick it was. How they saw themselves, first off, as you know, the country leading the slave trade and getting rich to their duty to end slavery, at least this version of slavery. Am I not a man and a brother? And the problem with this is it shows one of the contradictions within the abolitionist movement. Yes, they wanted to end slavery, but this shows it pretty clearly. It didn't necessarily mean they wanted equality for everybody. You notice, it's not him standing up. He's praying to somebody to free them, a.k.a. somebody with power. Yeah, and so there's a big racist element to the abolitionist movement. Oh, sure, we want slavery so we can free the savages. And so there's a lot of contradiction, not always. I mean, certainly not people like Frederick Douglass or William Lloyd Garrison, but a lot. It was a very complex. Couple review, couple dates. Remember, 1619 is the date we know for certain that the first African slaves landed in what's going to be called, or what will become the United States, at least the British colonies. There were probably some slaves of African descent in St. Augustine before that, but that's a little bit more of a gray area. And we, but remember, slavery at first, was not the slavery it's going to become. Yes, horrific conditions, but it was it was not race based. Let me rephrase that: color of skin based, and it was not necessarily permanent. It was not their, their children would not necessarily be slaves. It was really confusing. But can't forget this key day. Always got to come back to that. We can never forget Bacon's Rebellion, because that would be the trigger to the slave codes. Most importantly, the fornication laws, permanent slavery and racism and it's amazing how fast what we call racism would develop two generations where it just became natural and what a great justification for colonization for white people we're colonizing people who are inferior and it just worked it just all fit together but slavery was not race-based until then and i should add spanish colonies they all adopted really fast it might have happened without Bacon's Rebellion. Obviously, there's no way to know that, but that's kind of like the day we start seeing that big shift. So we know that. And then a couple things about this. So, so as slavery became a little more profitable, remember we talked about the triangular trade once before, but the ship guns or whatever, rum to Africa, trade for slaves. 
then take the sugar back out to here. But this right here, what do they call this section? You know, that's the middle passage. And we got to talk a little bit about the middle passage. Some of you probably talked about this, know a little bit about it. We got to mention a little bit. And the big thing about it is, when the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade are talked about, this is the part that even the most devout pro-slavery zealots didn't want to talk about, because it was held beyond our even remotest comprehension. We can't, we can't wrap our mind around how awful it was. Now we have a pretty. There's a been a number of statistical studies. We have a pretty good idea that over 11 million people were forcibly taken from Africa to the Americas. And the reason why is these slave ships kept meticulous records. The reason why is insurance. They had to buy insurance in case something happened to the ship. And so they had to report how many slaves there, how many people they had killed. And so there's really good records, not for every ship, but we then can. Uh, Hugh Thomas did a big, really, um, his book, it's called The Slave Trade, but it, they went through a really big statistical analysis. And 11 million, it could be a little bit more, a little bit less. The point is unimaginable. And about a third died on the trip. Most went to Brazil or the Caribbean, sugar plantations. And the sugar plantations literally just chewed human beings. Just chewed them. They caught this constant need for people. Most would die in the first six months, just constantly bringing in people. So about half a million went to what is now the United States. Um, in Virginia, their governor just proposed a change to the uh, their um, their curriculum all the way up through junior high by saying that the uh, slaves were immigrants, and I found that fascinating. Implying they have, we just choose to come to the United States. Here we go. Yay. Yes. Was it, was this, or was it 19th century Virginia or 20th century? Wait, about a week ago. Sounds believable given what I know and feel about Virginia. Well, Virginia now, it's, it's a state of rest. Now, it turns out their board of education turned it down because it was kind of ridiculous, but it's still, that still idea is there. Should add, most of the slaves were prisoners or debtors. We don't know the exact number. Uh, I, I was always told when I was in school, I remember, you know, it was always prisoners. They wanted the slave trip, the slave hunt, where various kingdoms would attack other kingdoms to get slaves with the idea they could slaves, they could trade for muskets to protect themselves from other slave hunters from other tribes, and then that would lead them to get more slaves. And pretty soon they just ravaged the Western Africa. But we now know that it's probably a significant number of debtors. People could not pay their debts and either gave their children up as indentured servitude, kind of like indentured servitude, or they were going to work themselves out of it and then got caught up in it. Indentured servants are slaves, and so they work off their debt. And what happened is they just never got the chance to work off the debt. They were just sold to the slave traders on the coast and then gone. Which makes it, I think, even more terrifying than being a prison to me. And these long trains of slaves would go be forced through your know, African, you know, locals slaving other locals. You know, these, these big kingdoms here. I should add, because of the slave trade, the kingdoms would be so disrupted that it allowed for Europeans to, to make a protectorate and then conquer it in the 19th century. Because the slave trade is so disrupted. And these long trains of slaves, same kind of thing in the United States when they ship the Slaves from Virginia, where they had oversupply slaves to where they were desperate in need of them, like in Mississippi. And here's a pretty common thing to keep people disciplined along the trip. Do you see what's about ready to happen in this point? You see it? See the axe? An example. Make it an example. So it's so terrifying everybody else that they won't run away. And some might be prisoners, some might be debtors, also just caught in this, but they're slaves. That's the way they treated them. And they were brought to the coast, and then the various kingdoms, so they'd be traded to these slave forts. Here's a Dutch fort uh, right here, right here. But they're British forts, 
name it, you name it, there are forts all on this coastline, and they would be sold. There's no real very good harbors in that part of Africa, so the ships would just anchor off the shore. They'd roll them out. Most Africans, of course, had never been on the water because most lived in the interior. The sea's really rough there, too, so it's just not very good even for small fishermen, so there just weren't very many. And they'd be put on these slave ships. Those would they be owned by Europeans. Portuguese, British, Dutch, American. And this is from an anti-slavery journal showing a tight packer. They figure a third is going to die no matter how they pack them in because of the absolute shock of being on board this ship, the terror of what happened. Um, just unimaginable terror. And so they figure if they're going to die, we pack as many humans as we can to maximize profits. And they would purposely put people from different languages, you know, different groups, ethnic groups, they'd separate them so they couldn't try to, to rebel. And then when they get on board the ship, here they show them dragging them down, strapping them down. Here we see the hammer, that's what they would use to hammer the bolt into the chains. So it's almost impossible to get them out. Unless you have another tool. And it shows them with a loincloth, but they strip them naked. Everybody, strip them naked. And that's the whole process is to break them, dehumanize them. Because one of the things that makes us human is we want to cover up. Yeah, this is one of the things that's human. Everyone, cover up a little bit at least. And strip them. Just that process of just total terror adds to everything else, dehumanizing nature. A lot of times, special like the Spanish slave trips would also be a Catholic priest blessing them in kind of a surreal image. And then they pack them down underneath for a week and not let them out. So when they did begin, then every day they sort of would bring them up on the deck. They wouldn't see my enemy. But they had to keep them down there until you know, basically break them. And these are ultra type packers. That they would have them kneel either like this or chain them like this and push them in. They pack it another third. Maximize the profits. And they would plant, they would have food, usually wheat or corn gruel, just enough for them to survive. But they figure as they go what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, they'll they'll die. They'll have less. You know, they, they figure they'll need less food every day. That's good. And here, this is probably a little bit later on in the trip, but um, but sometimes these intercoastal slave ships, for example, taking slaves from Virginia down here, they wouldn't pack them as tight because they already knew the language and they're worried that packing too tight would be even better, bigger chance of it. As soon as they're away from the coast, they bring them on board. And a couple things you can see. I think this is a picture. Oh, yeah. And normally they would flog somebody maybe to death this first time they brought them on board. Same deal. Terrifying. Once the, these four, once um, the people start realizing the hell of this, we're not going to get out. Can't see landing. We have no idea what's going on. We're not going to get out. Yeah, about second weeks when they were going. They would bring them on the deck to try to get them to move around. They throw water on them to wash them off. If there's no bathrooms, you know, they're chained down and they, you know. And so they would usually beat somebody nearly to death. Here they have a little bit of rice gruel. Rape was endemic on these ships. Um, they show them with clothes on, but they'd be completely naked. And this one's a pretty amazing picture. This one shows so much of the brutality. And they're torturing one person, but here they're force feeding. And the force feeding, they would take a metal pipe and they would literally pound it down their throat. What, what are people going to do? If you're stuck in this situation, impossible situation, they really good. And so they force feed one person the hell of that which might kill them, convince other students. Is that the point here? One thing they never talk about, you never see it like when you see a movie of slave ships, 
they always they don't have the nets. They put the net all the way around. And that shows why. You see it? Get out of it. Are you kidding? And so this was despair like we can't even imagine. And this is what they said. We're going to stop the slave trade. One more thing. If they started, if they'd miscalculated the food, they just would go and call through and pick humans that look like they might not survive or get as much profit and just dump them over. They say the sharks would just fall. Especially if the trip would take a week or two longer if they have if they thought that bad wind. Or if they saw, see the Union Jack? They saw a Royal Navy vessel and they saw that ensign. That's another word for a flag. They might dump everyone. Rather than caught by the by the Royal Navy and accused of being pirates. Think about four to six weeks ago. And so when they banned the slave trade, they could say, see, we're not part of this anymore. We're not part of this. So they could act like it wasn't as bad. When they arrive at the shore, get them on board, get them moving, or get them off, get them moving as quickly as possible. This is 1769. 94 prime healthy Negroes consisted of German men, but you know, get the point there. And they would cover, they make them eat a bunch of fat. I mean, literally like force feed them fat. Fat, they crave it, make them feel a little bit better. It just, because their body craves fat. So we're human. And then they cover them with blood. It makes them look a little healthier and hides the wounds from the chickens. And they'd be poked and trotted like someone was looking buying a horse or whatever it might be. And here, slave market, this is Augusta, Georgia. And these slave markets would exist for all the way to the end of slavery, but these are the first ones that get off the middle, the middle passage. And that's why in 1808, when the United States banned the slave trade and said no more international slave trade, remember that building about the fugitive and spread them out. Then now the United States would say, see, we are no longer part of this horrific trade from Africa. But two things, first up, Oh, this is from the same anti-slavery. I decided to put the whole, they call it a plate of the illustration from that book. These are some of the most famous ones ever. You've seen it, it's in the textbook. It's one of the more famous. So two things. First off, remember diffusion turned into a way to protect slavery. But look at the numbers. Do you see it? It still was really high. There was a loophole. They could no longer ship people from Africa over the Middle Passage and call them slaves. That was banned. But they could still trade slaves. So they could say, well, we're still going to trade slaves from Virginia traders. That was still perfectly fine. Or perhaps slaves from Cuba. You see the loophole. So they would make two manifests and they would literally make up fake, usually Spanish names for all the people from Africa and say they came from Cuba. And of course, if one cursory check will realize they're not from Africa. Remember, this is all a comedian little game they can play. So they can continue to bring in Africans. So you notice it comes in peaks, but it's still what happened. You'll notice right here, why is this? <coughs> the Royal Navy. They just stopped, they really stopped it. Right now it's good, there's good things and bad things about Britain, but they did do that. So here's the issue. They thought slavery would slowly go away. And then the Industrial Revolution, cotton, oh boy. And now slavery will profit. The Industrial Revolution, and who invented the cotton gin? Who took the credit for it? Eli Whitney. And the thing about cotton was this. There was long, uh, uh, um, long fiber cotton right here that would have this long piece that picked it really easy, but that was just only on the coast of Georgia and South Carolina. Short fiber cotton 
they literally have a, a hard seed. And when the cotton was ready to pick, the seed would pop open. But you had to get it fast or that cotton would begin to rot. And so they'd have to, by hand, break it, pull the cotton. Time-consuming, labor-intensive, very difficult. But the cotton gin, you would dump it in here and had a roller with bristles on it. And they'd crank it. And those bristles would tear off pieces of the seed, just yank them apart. And so the seed would fall off and big amount of cotton flock would come through. The first ones would do the work of uh, 10 people, but eventually they could do work of. I saw a magpie. Squirrel. No. See, this is why it's really hard to do classes outside. I've tried it, you know, oh, it's a nice day. Let's go outside. Doesn't work. Because everyone's like, hey, bird, bar, bee. Now, I like that stuff, but it's hard to, okay, back to this. So, rip job, you get the cotton. Eventually, they work up 100 people. So, now, limited number of slaves, but it's profit. You can get more work per slave and therefore make a profit to meet the demand. And so, 334,000 bush bales of cotton. 1.5 million slaves. Look how productivity went up to 4.5 million. 4.5 million barrels and 4 million slaves. That means each slave was producing significantly more cotton per person. That's money. And if a slave produces more, that's more wealth in the hands of the plantation owner. Most slaves were on the big plantations. And so, huge amount of cotton production. And there's Eli Whitney. That's a cotton gin. That's his actual. Patent design. I just thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. and this met the demand. Now we can meet the demand. But once you meet the demand, the demand is going to keep going up. Here's the thing about cloth. Cloth is actually really hard to make. I used to have to make all my own shirts from nothing but cotton fiber. Fiber stuff. Well, can you imagine how hard it would be to make cloth? Now you could buy it. Pretty soon, all those old skills are gone. One generation, no one can make it. And so that means even more demand for cotton because you need more demand for this. And it's just built and built and built. We can see this with things now. I mean, once the uh, uh, better reception on the cell phone, for example, and cameras were a big deal, so they couldn't make the production. So demand for slaves skyrocketed. And that's why their value would go up so much. And that's why so much money would go into it. They would borrow from banks. Banks would invest. The entire financial system of the United States was wrapped up in buying these really expensive slaves. It's one of the great ironic twists that the Industrial Revolution would lead to the most demand for slaves you can imagine. And here's a couple of pictures of the cotton gin. And this also shows one of the myths of slavery. You see the slaves here? How do they look? Yay, we're slaves! Here's one from a textbook showing the happy slave picking cotton. By the way, it wouldn't be a, a basket. It would be a long burlap bag. It would drag behind it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have a question. What? Were there ever any measures in place to prevent slaves from themselves. Oh, it was a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it was a problem. So they would they would talk me if you got caught doing that, that would be a big punishment. Yeah. It wasn't it, for the just end it, you know. Here's another one. Look how happy they are. Doesn't this kind of fit in with that positive good theory of slavery? So they played this myth quite well. So pretty soon cotton would be known as King Cotton. And the black belt was a rich black soil, just so fertile all along here. And that's where the big plantations, cotton would just amazing plantation. And you go there today and you have these really big plantations and the, the, the plantation matter to try to make it look like an English gentleman's home. But it's actually some of the poorest areas in the United States because they just took all the wealth out. That's one of the things about 
places like this. You know, they suck the wealth out and go someplace else. You you all probably know a place like that because all of you have been to Butte. All that wealth and it was sucked out and taken someplace else. And so, oh, and this shows, okay, now, the most active production of cotton, the largest number of slaves. See this right here? Now let me show you the next map. Here, for a fiber cotton. The black um, This is kind of a weird transition for climate. It wasn't very good for cotton or, at least then, tobacco and then tobacco. And they had so many slaves here, but tobacco production was pretty low. That's why they would sell so many down here. But now look at this again. Everyone see this, right? The next map I'm going to show you is the percentage of slaves. And the ones in blue, that's the percentage of slaves. Green, whites, red, free, blacks. See it? 57, 44, 44, 57, 40, or 55, 47. If you do nothing else, Nothing else. They just saw this. You could guess right away the first state. It's a C, can't you? And it's just obvious. What's the first state? What's the second state? And then what happened? These all went together in one. And then Texas was just such a weird case about the way the Texas came in, they followed. What states came in later to the Confederacy? Lower percentage of slaves. What states stayed in the United States and did not? Join the Confederacy? The fewest percentage of slaves. Politicians have most of these. And so with that, they have more political power than the slaveholders. And more political power. And the higher the percentage of slaves, what's the greatest fear? That issue of slavery. You combine more money to lose. We have more political power. And in South Carolina, especially, they rigged the political system. So the big plantation owners, and they all lived in Charleston, had these they're actually really beautiful mansions and very understated until you go in a mansion in, in, in Charleston. But they had all the political power, all of it. And so nearly 60% of all exports Nearly 60% of all exports. That's why they thought they could win. They thought they could win the Civil War. But they also saw all exports are going up. And they said someday, very soon, this percentage will drop. In 1860, Southern politicians are thinking we might be the strongest we're ever going to be. And Britain needs this cotton. They will intervene on our side and we can win. Remember, the United States won the Revolutionary War because France, and to a lesser degree, the Netherlands and Spain intervened. If Britain would have intervened, the Confederacy would have won. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Wait a second, isn't Britain the anti-slavery country? Yes, but they have textile rights. And so with that, even though the cotton was there, there's going to be no industry in the South. The money, the big money that goes, that's needed for capital, that's needed for to buy the factories, that went to slaves and land. This is a Trinidad Iron Works in Richmond. There were very few factories there. Extra money and wealth went to slaves and land. And therefore, they're anti-tariff. If there's no industry to protect, you don't want to pay the higher prices, so northern industry. And therefore, they're anti-roads. That's why there aren't as many railroads. That's why there's not as many canals in the South. And that legacy exists to this day. Anti-tax. Now, Montana is relatively anti-tax. We have different reasons for it. But in the South, it is a tradition that goes back to slavery. Yet look at the North. The North has virtually all the industry 
And then what goes with it? The finance, the banking, the people, and the sense that the wealth is growing. Now, remember, the richest people in the United States are in the South. But there's a feeling that the wealth is in the North. These tables show industrial workers, 1.3 to 100,000. The value of goods produced, 1.5 billion in the North, 155 million in the South. There was more industry in the city of New York City alone than all the South combined. And therefore, look at the population. Heck, this might be an issue. Firearms, 32 to 1 in the North. Pig iron. Uh, pig iron is just the term for kind of uh, refined iron. A lot of the impurities are taken out. When they would make it, it would, it would bubble and make like a snort of these things. Hey, yeah. Do you mean that they're against the clearing or against the nation with 32 times more firearms than them? Yeah, they knew they all, but they also figured they had the advantage of being on the defense and Britain will join it. But they thought they're in the minority. They're under threat any day now. They might end. And so they thought we're going to be weaker every day. We better do it now. But that's a good point. And I should add, once again, everybody knew it. And if you secede, that's civil war. They all knew it. They knew the South was starting. They knew it. And so this is basically proto-capitalist. The humans are the capital. The humans are the machine. So it's like embryonic capital, but it's not the machines dominate and everything for sale. That's going to happen with capitalism. They just want a machine, human beings. And these are the couple peak value of slaves. First Industrial Revolution, then the peak uh, 1840s when it came out of the panic, and then right before the Civil War. One thing you also notice, look at this picture right here. This is the value per slave. Is it $2,000? Uh, Did it go down right before 1860? You can imagine what slaveholders are thinking. Uh oh. It's already happening. And how did this function? The last thing for today, I know I'm not quite get to it, but how they did it, these massive slave labor camps, AKA plantations. How did they do it? It's called the pushing system or the quota. So when it, let's say they got a slave from Virginia. They would um, drag him down there through this forced march. They let him recover, feed him pretty well. He'd go out in the field and they'd teach him how to pick cotton. And then they would say, okay, pick cotton. One out. How much can you pick? And there's someone like pushing him to work hard. That's pushing. And they pick a bunch of cotton. They wait and say, okay, that's your quota. You have to get that every hour you work. Wait for wait. And if you don't do it, what will happen? And I'll, I'll pick this up tomorrow. I'll start here. If they don't make it, they're tortured. That's how the system works. Shoot, I didn't quite get this. I blame. No, the, uh, the lizard people. I, I can blame the reptilians for a lot, but I'm going to blame Canada. Blame Canada. All right. Blame Bye, everybody. Canada. Ten question little quiz. It'll be easy, I promise. I've even printed them. Have a good day, everybody. We will see you, we, the royal we. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, actually, that's real challenging. Hey, 
Thank you. Congrats. Awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, well. Yes. Oh, I tried to kick it. God, I failed the button. I've been so bored not talking. I'm not talking. I'm not even talking. I'm not even talking. I'm not even Hey, who would like a gift? Okay, so I did have a big old change on my uh what I was gonna do over Thanksgiving. I was gonna leave you the documents, I didn't quite make it to where I wanted to. Hey, that's why. But I have three things for you to pick up. Three, count them, three. So everybody, you can walk up and pick up one of each. This is a reading called Horseman in the Sky. That would be your opportunity for extra credit. And then two things I'm writing in EPQ. Everybody, come up and grab one. One might have a magic tick. Oh, Richard the Lion Party. Stop recording.